Pennsylvania Congressman Matt Cartwright is one of just a handful of Democrats who held on to House seats in districts that voted for President Trump. He narrowly won a fifth term in northeastern Pennsylvania's 8th district, defeating Republican nominee James Bognett by just over 12,000 votes. And he did so while running on a progressive agenda, including support for Medicare for All. In 2019, the congressman voted to impeach President Trump. His win comes as the Democratic Party is doing some soul-searching after a disappointing showing in down-ballot races. Representative for Pennsylvania's 8th District and co-chair of the House Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, Congressman Matt Cartwright, joins me now. Congressman, thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure, Elaine. How are you doing? I'm doing well. The Washington Post called you the most liberal Democrat left in a Trump district. How did you win, and what did you think other Democrats might have gotten wrong in their bids to pick up House seats? Uh, that second part is a much tougher question, but I can talk about what I did. Um, look, it's it's about establishing your own brand. Uh, Elaine, I think the, the two biggest questions that, that every politician running for any office, dog catcher on up, uh, is um, number one, uh, 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 to persuade the voters that you care about them. You know, every voter uh, sizing up a politician has two questions. Number one, does this politician care about me? And number two, will he or she work hard for me? Uh, if you can establish that, uh, you're so far ahead of the game, and that's before you get to any policy questions or you know, are you liberal? Are you conservative? Uh, if if they know you care about them, uh, you've answered 80 percent of their questions. Do you think that maybe some of your fellow Democrats didn't quite establish that? Well, it's it's hard to say. I, uh, I can tell you in my own district, uh, uh, I, I wrestled with, you know, why did so many people vote for Donald Trump? 9.6 percent uh, was his mar uh, winning margin in my district in 2016. Um, and so why did all of these people vote for Trump? And the answer was, um, our economy is kind of just bumping along in northeastern Pennsylvania. A lot of people are hurting. And when you're hurting, there is a universal rule in politics. You vote for the candidate of change. Uh, President Obama won big in our area. Uh, change was his slogan. Change we can believe in. Um, and, it, you know, as intelligent and bright and as accomplished as Secretary Clinton was, there was just no way she could establish herself as the candidate of change in 2016. Um, and, and, and that's what happened, I think. Uh, people were hurting in, in my district. And here's my approach is uh, I don't condemn people for voting for Trump. Far from it. Uh, I take it as a clarion call to Democrats like me to realize these people are hurting and to remember that it is our party, the Democratic Party, that cares the most about people who are hurting. So my resolve in 2016 and going forward was to redouble my efforts uh, to, to help take care of them and figure out their problems and try to make uh, life work better uh, for, uh, for the kitchen table issues. Uh, for the regular uh, butcher, baker, and candlestick maker, uh, the regular working people in, in my district. Uh, and I, the candidates who can figure that out uh, and can bring that home as a message, they're the ones who win. So you were confident so that Joe Biden could win back parts of Pennsylvania. Was that because, in your mind, people there you thought were disappointed with President Trump? or because of something that the Biden campaign specifically had to offer? Uh, both. Uh, they, they, uh, they were disappointed in President Trump. Uh, a lot of what people liked uh, the president for um, was uh, his promise of building infrastructure. Uh, uh, he built himself as a, a developer, uh, uh, as a builder, somebody who could get the job done and who would get the job done. Uh, you know, uh, I got elected to Congress in 2012. The entire time I've been in the, in the Congress, we haven't done a major infrastructure bill. Uh, that is a shame uh, because everybody knows we need roads and bridges and water systems and sewer systems and broadband internet for rural places. 
I mean, Elaine, something like Flint, Michigan uh, should never have happened. But that's the kind of thing that's going to continue to happen unless we shoulder our burden and and rebuild and reinforce our infrastructure and make it better uh, for everybody. Uh, the, the big promise with President Trump was that he would do that, and he didn't. And that was the big disappointment. Uh, I love it that uh, Joe Biden's slogan has been build back better, uh, because that goes directly to what he's promising, actually to get infrastructure done. And I think he can do it. So let's talk more about the direction of your party. Uh, earlier this month, several of your peers were placing blame for losing seats in the election. And I want to listen to some sound. First, let's hear Virginia Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger's leaked audio from a House Democratic conference call. Then we'll hear from Representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Connor Lamb, respectively, speaking to The New York Times. Let's listen to that. We need to not ever use the word socialist or socialism ever again. Because while people think it doesn't matter, it does matter. And we lost good members because of that. If we are classifying Tuesday as a success from a congressional standpoint, we will get torn apart in 2022. We know that progressive policies uh, do not hurt candidates. Every single candidate that that co-sponsored Medicare for All in a swing district kept their seat. We learned that high turnout elections are not automatically Dem wins, but also I believe we've learned that we can't run away from progressive policy either. The rhetoric and the policies and all that stuff, it has gone way too far. It needs to be dialed back and it needs to be rooted in common sense, in reality. And yes, politics, because we need districts like mine to stay in the majority and get something done for the people that we care about the most. So, Congressman, what do you make of those arguments? Well, I, here's what I think about when I hear things like that, uh, Elaine. It's, um, it's a red herring. Uh, uh, it's a distraction. Uh, you know, uh, we think about the things that we need to do for our constituents. Make sure they have um, more available and affordable health care. Make sure the government works better for them. Uh, do things like... Uh, build infrastructure, so that's going to lead to uh, greasing the skids for more American businesses doing better uh, and, and, and more and, and higher paying jobs. Uh, these are the things that really matter to people. Um, and, and, you know, uh, we can talk about those things. We can focus on them. And along comes um, somebody who says, well, hey, wait a minute. Look at that. Look at that beautiful red fish swimming along there. Um, let's all forget about what's important and let's look at that red fish. Well, that's what a red herring is. That's a distraction. Uh, and it takes away your attention from what really matters. Don't be, don't be swayed by red herrings like, you know, policy uh, debates between this congressperson and that congressperson. Focus on what's good for the American people, what, you know, what's going to make them stop hurting, what's going to take away the kind of hurt that led them, them to vote for uh, President Trump in the first place. Uh, th this is why I, I, I try not to be distracted by these sort of sideshows, because that's what they are. They're just red herrings. I hear what you're saying, but I wonder if you think that... Um perhaps some of the rhetoric may get in the way of that thing you discussed off the top, and that is making that connection with voters. We're talking about broadly the direction of your party, and the messaging is part of that connection, right, that is made that you talked about in establishing with voters to let voters know that they care. So I'm wondering if some of the ways that these ideas have been voiced um, if you have specific thoughts about whether or not that brings voters in closer or pushes them away. Sure. Well, I, I can tell you, uh, a, a lot of people have, have pointed out that I'm a co-sponsor of Medicare for All. Uh, and, and I am, and I'm proud of it. And, and the way I describe it uh, is that I want uh, to expand health care as much as possible, because I think when you get right down to it, what do we want? We want every family to be covered with health insurance. This is not a novel thing, Elaine. This is something that people have talked about for 100 years. In fact, 
uh, when, if somebody challenges me for being a progressive, I remind them that uh, uh, my favorite progressive uh, was named Theodore Roosevelt. And it was Theodore Roosevelt who first proposed universal health coverage. Uh, I think that's a terrific idea. It worked in all kinds of countries. Um, and I think that we ought to do what we can to move in that direction. Um, it's, uh, it, it's something that, uh, that I'll continue to work on as long as I'm in the Congress, uh, because the, the more health health care security we have, uh, the more we're able to focus on our, our, our dreams, achieving our dreams, uh, pulling people out of poverty and into the middle class and, and uh, allowing people in the middle class a chance at, at reaching their American dreams. My idea is let's focus less on the rhetoric and focus more on delivering uh, for making opportunity in America a reality and not just some sort of slogan. So is your win proof, you think, that both parties should perhaps make more room for progressive ideas? A absolutely. Uh, I, I, I'm an unabashed progressive. Uh, my, uh, my slogan this this campaign was let's move America forward, let's move northeastern Pennsylvania forward. We can make government work better for people, and that's what progressivism is all about. All right, Congressman Matt Cartwright, Congressman, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Elaine, good to be with you.